All right, it is four o'clock, and you know what that means, folks. It's time for another episode of Student Affairs Live. I'm your host, Eric Stoller, and this is the show for student affairs professionals. That's right, it's your own show. You get to learn about topics, have guests come on, we interview them, we ask questions, and we tweet about it, all kinds of cool stuff. Again, I want to put a few things out here for everyone. Higher Ed Live is our network. Student Affairs Live is part of Higher Ed Live, so feel free to check out our website, higheredlive.com. For today's action, please follow the tweets at hashtag SA Live. And also, please pay attention to the at Higher Ed Live uh, Twitter account because Ardith, my awesome intern, is tweeting her last show uh, for at least a little while. And so pay attention to her tweets. She's going to tweet a whole bunch of cool things out there to folks. And again, folks, Student Affairs Live would be nothing without our sponsor. So I really want to give a shout out to Integral, who are the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Make sure you check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. And that happens this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And Ardith is sending out a tweet with that link right now. want to give a special announcement for this show is that I'm going to the National Conference on Student Recruitment, Marketing, and Retention, uh, which is being put on by Noel Levitz. It's in July. It's in Denver. Uh, I've written about it a little bit for Inside Higher Ed. I'm going as a representative of Student Affairs Live. I'm going to be tweeting, writing, uh, putting out all sorts of comments about the sessions and the event. And I think it's going to be uh, a really informative event, and I'm really excited about it. So please feel free to uh, take a look at that conference because there's just a, really, uh, just a ton of really cool sessions. So folks, we've got an amazing show today. I uh, want to give a quick uh, you know, sort of virtual welcome or hello uh, to a good friend of mine, uh, Jennifer Jocelyn. Hey, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Eric. Oh, I, I'm so pleased that you could make it. It's fun to have an, an Oregonian on the show. I, I played that music for you. Uh, you know, <laughs> that I love my ducks music will probably never be on the show again because oh. the, the folks from Oregon State are probably pulling my diploma right now. That's uh, right. They're rescinding my degree just because I played that. So Absolutely. They're doing the alpha search. There you go. Exactly. Well, Jennifer, I'm really excited to talk about academic advising with you here in just a little bit. Well, thanks for having me. It's, it's a delight. I could talk about academic advising for hours, so it, it's a treat to be asked. Well, you know, as long as folks keep watching, we'll just keep going, so we'll see what <laughs> happens. All right, everybody. So as you know, I do a little feature on the show called Challenge and Support. It's my weekly news feature where I sort of share a couple of news stories that I think are worthy for folks to see, take a look at, put a few comments out there, see what folks have to say. So the first thing is, I saw an article in the Educause Review, uh, really it was kind of cool because it was written by a chief information officer at the institution, uh, the title was Student Engagement Challenges from a CIO Perspective. And honestly, if, if you haven't checked out Educause and you're in student affairs, check them out because they put out a lot of really good resources for folks. And this is the kind of article that I haven't seen before in the past, really, is sort of a student engagement meets IT at a university. So that perspective is one that I think we, we really need to sort of delve into a little bit more, especially from folks who are probably less IT and more student affairs oriented. Really excited about this. This just came out recently. The SA Tech Boston Unconference. Uh, it, it's kind of, it was the, sort of the brainchild of my good friend Ed Cabellin. And Ed, along with Mike Hamilton and Ken Elmore, uh, are going to host this conference, this unconference, SA Tech Boston, at Boston University. It's going to be July 29th. Uh, last time I checked, there were 70 some spots remaining out of the 90. So I have a feeling this event, which is free, by the way, is going to fill up really quickly. A lot of cool topics. Uh, just have a feeling this is going to be kind of a really cool event, probably a signature event uh, each year if we can have sort of an SA Tech unconference. I think that would be amazing. All right, switching gears a little bit here. I saw this in the quick takes from Inside of Higher Ed this week uh, with the title of Alabama Will Bar Undocumented Students. Now, a lot of states have uh, tuition policies that they sort of write out towards uh, undocumented students. They either uh, have them pay uh, out-of-state tuition or if it's perhaps in the case of California, which I'll mention here in a second, uh, there's a little bit of a different sort of tuition situation. However, Alabama has put forth uh, some legislation that would actually bar uh, students who don't have the proper documentation from attending college at all in the state of Alabama, which, folks, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, so I'm going to point this out really quickly, is if, if you're an undocumented student and, and you were brought over, let's say, when you were five years old from, from another country uh, by your parents, by a guardian or family member, etc., uh, 
legally, the states that you're in, they require you to go through the K through 12 system just like any other kid uh, in the state. So what, what's happening a lot of times to undocumented students is, you know, you've lived practically your entire life in the United States. You've gone through K through 12. You graduate high school. You could be the valedictorian of your high school graduating class. And if you're in the state of Alabama, they're essentially saying to you, you can't go to college even though you've lived here for the past, what, 12, 13 years potentially, and you are an outstanding student. So folks, get up on this really quickly. This is some important stuff to learn about. Uh, if you've never heard about the DREAM Act, take a look at it because people don't think about what this from sort of the, the human side of it, the sort of the heart side of it, because if you've gone to school your whole life in the States and then you're told you can't go to college, that is a big deal and that is really important to those of us that work in student affairs. Switching it up a bit, California, the Supreme Court of California just said, you know what? We're not going to look at this California policy about sort of discounted tuition for folks who don't have documentation. There was a, a lawsuit that was brought forward by, uh, I believe, a group of students who were from out of state uh, who were saying, hey, we pay out of state tuition. However, folks who are undocumented in the state of California um, get some tuition breaks. Um, and, and fortunately, the Supreme Court basically said, you know, we're not going to take a look at this. We're going to keep it up, keep it the way it's going. And, and I think it was the right decision because, again, most folks who are undocumented are not flush with cash. Um, I guarantee you most students and anybody that, that, that says otherwise is probably not telling the truth if they look at sort of financial aid packages, but most students that come from out of state, they get quite a bit of, of aid and, and or they just have a lot more financial resources at their disposal to pay the out of state tuition that is usually considerably more at an institution, especially when you think of something like a Berkeley, that kind of thing. Switching it up, going over to Goshen College. Uh, Goshen College has actually banned the playing of the national anthem at their sporting events, uh, saying that it's not in line with the, the mission and values of the institution. Uh, they've got a really good website, though. It sort of outlines the, the, the rationale behind this, why they did it, and it's really a, a fascinating sort of discussion around what it means to be an institution that's sort of framed around the value of peace and, and sort of their thinking around why they're not going to play the... Um, the national anthem, and so I, I just was really fascinated by this story, and I don't think a lot of her, folks heard about it yet, so uh, take a look at that. Last piece of challenge and support for the week comes from Iowa, my home state of all places. Uh, it just kind of caught my eye that this there's, there's a, a legislator there who basically said to the students, shut up, I don't want to hear you, I don't want to hear your opinion, thanks for coming, but you know what, go back home. And they actually have the audio, the MP3 file, of him saying that to these students who were basically just there to talk about um, some fee increases and some funding that was being taken away. Um, and and as, as citizens of the state of Iowa, they have the right to go you know, talk to their representatives. And here was the representative saying, I don't want to talk to you right now. And it's very condescending, kind of patronizing. And so um, really an interesting story out of, out of Iowa of all places. So take a look at that. I know Ardith will be tweeting that out uh, via the SA Live hashtag. So I always do an unsolicited shout-out of the week. Uh, the shout-out could be a person, place, thing, a company, service, that kind of thing. And there was a post, I think it came out, uh, maybe I saw it on Twitter or Facebook or my RSS somewhere. You know, it pretty much goes out everywhere. And this post came out from the Big Think blogs, one of their bloggers, and it was Scott McLeod. And if you've ever followed his blog, Dangerously Irrelevant, uh, they recently moved it over to Big Think so that he's actually writing now uh, on behalf of Big Think. Uh, so my shout out of the week this week goes to Scott McLeod specifically for his post, If You Were On Twitter. Uh, it was a, a really awesome post. It lists sort of really cool reasons why folks could be on Twitter as opposed to saying, I don't get Twitter. It's not something of interest to me. Um, it's just, you know, the sort of anti-Twitter crowd who... Who, who needs some sort of, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of push, maybe a bit of a nudge as to why they should, should, look at, should look at Twitter. So that's my shout out this week. Again, it's Scott McLeod, writes for Big Think, awesome blogger. He actually does some stuff in, in Iowa as well, some uh, technology things with administrators. So check out his stuff. He tweets really good things as well. So he's at McLeod on Twitter. Okay, folks, this is it. You've been waiting a while for this episode. I know academic advisors have been just going all over for it, and I'm <laughs> pleased to bring on uh, Jennifer Jocelyn, who is the Director of Academic Advising at the University of Oregon, Go Ducks, uh, as well as the President-Elect of Nakata. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks so much, Eric. I'm excited. So I'm really glad you could come on today. I think that you know the viewers are really going to have a lot of questions for you. I'm already watching uh, the tweet stream uh, via SA Live. It looks like folks are kind of getting into it. 
And Jennifer, I was really hoping you could kind of maybe outline your background a little bit. Talk about how you got to your position now as a director of academic advising. Because I know as we talked yesterday, most of us didn't grow up as little kids saying, I want to be a, the director of academic advising somewhere. That's right. We don't hear that very commonly as part of somebody's uh, career path. Um, I actually came to academics and to academic affairs through student affairs. Um, I was a resident assistant at Occidental College, shout out to my alma mater, and also a head resident. We had a student run um, uh, residence life system and that was the first time I knew that you could be part of a, a job in this field and uh, fell in love with working with college students, fell in love with um, the, the whole picture that goes with a successful and uh, a learning environment. And so um, cast around for a little bit. I was always uh, very interested in uh, sports and also as I kind of came to consciousness as a feminist and as a lesbian, um, I was always interested in analysis of sports and so headed to graduate school at the University of Iowa, uh, one of the few places in the country where you can actually study women in sports specifically and uh, did my master's and PhD and as I worked more and more with students in the classroom as a graduate student, I realized uh, I loved the subject matter but I really loved uh, talking with students about their overall academic plan, where my classes were fitting into their larger picture. And so, um, lucky enough, as I, as I was going through this, this kind of career questioning period, I probably had a different name for it uh, at the time than career questioning period. Um, and I was lucky enough to land at the Academic Advising Center at the University of Iowa with Pat Folsom and Paul Cox and a lot of other colleagues. Um, really, in my opinion, one of the best advising centers in the country. So I, I was lucky to be there for about 13 years and then transitioned here to the University of Oregon uh, as director. So, and, and again, have continued my involvement uh, with really the good fortune to have terrific supervisors who always who always nurtured uh, the kind of professional understanding of the field. Well, that, I, that's it in a nutshell. That's that's quite the story. I mean, and I, you know, it's, it's really exciting to hear that you had such a great experience in Iowa. Uh, it's a fantastic state. Uh, I, I feel a little bad for you right now. I know you're at the University of Oregon. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not quite as good as that institution that's about 45 miles north. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I love that, that you just gave a shout out to Paul Cox. I think Paul's actually watching the show uh, with a oh, bunch super. of other advisors at the University of Iowa. I think he said that he had told about 45 other advisors that the show was going to happen today. So they're probably really excited down there in Hawkeye land. Yes, yes. Well, it was a terrific learning ground. And I'm lucky to have been in that environment and now at Oregon where, and you, I mean, you know what it's like to be an advisor in Oregon. It's, it's a very innovative place. There's lots of room to try new techniques, to, to do different things. And, and so I had a great foundation at Iowa and now I've, I've had this terrific chance to grow out here. Uh, so yeah, best of all worlds. Nice. Well, and I guess now that you're you're an administrator, you know you're essentially you know at some schools you would be called a head advisor, um, you know, and at University of Oregon you're a director level position. What what have you seen sort of as trends in academic advising? What are some of the things that you've sort of watched you know in the in the past sort of you know ten years of your career and things that you see coming down the pipe? Sort of what are the trends and what's the future right now of academic advising? Well, it's um, in terms of trends over time, we're really seeing uh, obviously a growth in technology and the ways in which technology is transforming the field. I've had some opportunity to talk with 25 and 30 year veterans of, the, of advising. And when they talk about technology, they're talking about um, a transition from not just a paper environment, but um, the ways in which students interacted with you, the, the ways in which you tried to uh, get students in, the face-to-face, the, -face, the slow pace of the term or, or semester, depending, just the pace of the job was so different. And even when I started uh, 15 years ago, we had dummy CRT terminals on our desk. There was one printer in our office for about 25 advisors. We walked to the kitchen, uh, to the printer, 
and uh, we didn't have PCs um, on our desks until the um, probably about the early 2000s. So I know that just sounds like forever ago, but now, of course, there are all sorts of innovative and amazing ways that we use the kind of traditional strengths of the field, which is uh, one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face or a real kind of caring commitment to the overall academic progress with the best of what technology does, which is mining data, um, using, a, using a lot of neat tools to reach broadly to reach a lot more students than you could reach individually with those individual postcards or letters or whatever uh, you might have used uh, more traditionally. Just be from enterprise-wide systems to social media, it's just an explosion of technology. I, I was just at the University of Melbourne uh, talking with them about academic advising and as we, as I talked with colleagues who are my age um, and, and older and slightly younger, I, I realized that we really don't have the luxury anymore to say, oh, that technology, that, that's something my newer advisors do. I don't do so much of that as an, as an administrator or as a veteran advisor. You know, we all have to be part of um, a technology innovation. We all have to stay up to date on tools. It, it's such an integral part of what we're doing in the field. So probably technology and technology growth, uh, one of the biggest trends Overall, in the 15 years that I've been an advisor, easily the professionalization of the field and the way in which we're doing such a terrific job of identifying um, your goals as an office or your goals as a unit and the larger educational mission of the university. Um, that's probably a, a huge a huge accomplishment to really tie advising to teaching, advising to the larger learning goals of your institution. Um, so those are those are two big trends, um, and certainly now the uh, importance of being resilient. The budget uh, crisis, the global financial crisis, the GFC, as my Australian friends were calling it, um, as well as the pressure from the state legislature that they're seeing in Ohio and Wisconsin and other states, um, the importance of really using data and assessment to, um, to tie the important role advising plays in, and obviously other student affairs offices, um, with, again, the goals you're trying to accomplish as an institution. Um, I, and, and again, I could just keep talking, but those are probably three of the bigger ones. No, you're, you're doing a great job. And I know for a fact that you're drinking water and I'm drinking Red Bull. <laughs> still still working on that sponsorship, Red Bull. Still working on it here. Um, and yes. so, you know, you're, you're doing a great job. I, I could probably chat just as much. Um, <laughs> you know, you talk about technology and, you know, you, that, that hits me right here, right in the heart. And, I, and I, I could talk about that a lot as well. And I'm really excited that you, you mentioned that because I know that before I left Oregon, before I moved from Oregon, you had a position up there uh, at the University of Oregon. Uh, it was sort of an academic advising technology position. I don't remember the exact title. Um, could you talk about that position a little bit? Because I've never seen anything like that at any other school. There are a few schools. I think University of Michigan has an advising center, um, and you know my colleagues there will correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure they've always had a tech. They've had a technology focus among their administrative team for a long time, um, and there are a few other schools. We positioned this as an assistant director for technology, and uh, the goal is not only is this um, colleague going to um, help us with bringing our campus note-taking system uh, all the way across campus to interested departments, again, to improve the way we communicate uh, with our colleagues, in uh, faculty colleagues and, and other professional advisors around student issues and, and about student notes and visits. Um, but we're also going to try to develop a strategic plan around uh, social media and uh, the ways in which we're using Facebook and Twitter um, and the web to, to have a, a long-term plan uh, that fits with, our, again, our goals of, the un of our unit and with the goals of the campus advisors and the goals of the institution. Um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm so struck by how integral our work is now in higher education with technology that I can't see ever being in another office that doesn't have a dedicated person to technology. I think it's crucial. Yeah, well, and it seems like in a lot of institutions, in, in advising offices, there's someone who sort of takes on the mantle 
um, you know, they're the, I'm interested in technology, and then they sort of get handed that extra yeah. duty. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one of the tricky things is now, compared to, again, when I began, um, there used to be one person to do hardware, software, applications, innovations, research, uh, note-taking, development, whether it was an access database or a commercial vending product. Wow. Now, of course, when one of the things we realized when we were searching is that um, th there's no one person anymore to do that. We could have hired uh, maybe a, a coordinator for social media and a coordinator for you know, the web, it's so incredibly um, granular now. There's there's so much specialization that it, um, it yeah, it, it can be kind of exciting and kind of challenging um, to group more than one technology focus uh, in one position. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Well, and I guess one question I have too, and I think probably folks have this question is, the, the person who's the, the it's, and it's an assistant director of technology? Yes, will yes. They, will they be advising students? Yes, so every, all the directors in our office have a small caseload. Okay. Uh, we also do p presentations for orientation. We're, we all sit on university committees. Um, yeah, we all see students in, in some degree, talk to parents, uh, work with colleagues on uh, emergency and other situations. So, yeah, very much still connected to okay. the whole goal of what we're doing, which is serving students. Yeah, well, and I, I want to make sure we point that out because I think that, you know, if people think about a, a assistant director of technology position, that that person sort of, on their own, kind of doing their technology stuff while the advising team is advising students. And I yeah. think it's crucial to note that, that that person's advising students. So it's someone who, you know, and so I guess the, the next question is, where do you find someone who has those skills? And, and also, when, when you're hiring, how do you word that? You know, sort of must be able to talk to people and <laughs> machines? Um, well, the neat thing is that all of the, I mean, we're kind of wrapping up that search now is that everybody interested in the position wanted to, to stay connected to students. No one wanted to just be off in the corner supervising uh, the Camtasia expert or the, um, the data input person. Every, uh, every one of them wanted to be part of our administrative team, part of working with students. Um, so it wasn't hard to find that. I think in the actual, the day-to-day -day of the position, we'll really have to listen carefully to the, it's such a burgeoning field. And of course, this is one of those fields where 120% of your day could be on development. And so it will be really important to listen to that colleague as, as they talk about how they want to stay connected and how they want to uh, use their caseload and, and all of that. So it's a new position and those are just typical growing pains. Okay, what do you, and, and, and you don't have to answer these questions if it's proprietary, <laughs> but in, in terms of ratio, uh, how many people that uh, position advise do you think? Oh, let's see. Um, we're, we're on kind of an odd, Oregon is kind of a, a very special. We can, we can say it. It's just an odd school, <laughs> that University of Oregon. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, man. The next time I, I'm bringing, I'm sending you some duck things. That's, okay. that's, that's pretty much that's what, fair. what I look, that's going to happen. Look, I look good in green and yellow, so it's fine. <laughs> um, it, it is a shared model and also a split model. So uh, for those of you who are big fans of Nakata models, so uh, students go right to departments. Uh, undeclared students come to us. We also see students for pre-professional. You know, there's all sorts of different ways students can access advising. Um, and so, um, you know, my caseload is about oh, 15 to 20 students. Uh, the assistant directors are somewhere between 25 and 35 students, plus all the emergency situations, plus their parents. Um, so, yeah, it, it's small compared to our advisor team, which they have a set caseload of about 175 advisees, but since we see broadly all across campus, our advisors probably see between 175 to about 900 students um, as part of their kind of typical year. Okay. Well, that's, wow. So that, that's actually really good. I mean, what is Nakata's recommendation is, was it like 300 to one, I think is the, the, the recommended professional ratio, give or take? Um, yeah, Nakata doesn't officially make a recommendation, oh. but in general, um, and this little shout out to Charlie Nutt who, there, who's in my in my ear policy wise. Um, we don't have a recommendation, but we do have lots of different uh, pieces of information from centers all over the country, um, and we do see kind of that ideal ratio somewhere between three and four hundred. Okay. Um, we see about ten thousand students in our uh, advising offices for about eight advisors. So. 
we're pretty uh, we're pretty busy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, you know, shout out to Charlie Nutt. Um, for a lot of folks who don't know Charlie, Charlie's the executive director of Nakata and probably the most energetic man around. Um, <laughs> I wanted to point out there was a, a cool tweet that came out from Clay Schwen, who's at the University of Washington. I, I guess it, this is like the Pac-10 episode of SA Live. Uh, there you go. And so Clay, and this sort of gave a... Eric? A little, yes. Eric, I think you mean quack tin. Oh, well, well anyway, um, I'm just going to bat that one aside. Clay, Clay pointed out a really cool, interesting use of, of Twitter uh, during orientation. I just thought I'd uh, put this out here, uh, share it with folks, because the tweets are going by so quickly. Uh, but he, he said that the University of uh, Washington Advising can't afford... Uh, 300 clickers for orientation, so they're going to use Twitter as, as a back channel for taking questions. And Clay, and, you know, Clay Schwinn, Kurt Zeiss, those guys at the University of Washington, you know, when people think about it, academic advising and technology, they probably think about you, Clay, Kurt, uh, obviously uh, Laura, Pasquini, uh, you know, folks who have been really championing technology and advising. And so it's really cool to have uh, Clay watching the show here and sort of sharing this because I think that. That's the thing. We kind of forget about some of these simple solutions when, when we do have so many students and we do have you know, various technologies at our disposal. Absolutely. Well, and um, I, I mean, Laura Pasquini contributes more IQ points to my own personal development. Uh, you, Laura, um, just uh, Art Esposito, I love what he's doing over at uh, the, uh, Virginia Commonwealth. Uh, George Steele with the Ohio Learning Network. Um, when I think of really new and innovative things that are going on. Uh, obviously, uh, Clay Schwinn and Sally Garner for podcasting. Um, Becca Schultz in our office has done this terrific, uh, with colleagues, uh, Grade First Aid, which is a blog for students in academic difficulty. Uh, that's on WordPress. Uh, just amazing kind of work. Brad Popielek at uh, U Texas Austin and his absolutely phenomenal um, web-based a uh, tool for un undeclared or exploratory majors, uh, Wayfinder, I think is the title of that. Mm. Just amazing to see the way they've partnered. I think they got a grant from the AT&T Foundation and partnered with their IT people and their career services people to create kind of a, a really innovative product for uh, un undeclared or exploratory majors at U Texas Austin. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of people doing really terrific stuff. It's an exciting time. Yeah, well, and it seems like, you know, in my short stint as an academic advisor, I did it professionally for three years, ad advising folks do a lot with technology. You know, you know, some folks would sort of put academic advising underneath the umbrella of student affairs, or and some folks put it in academic affairs. But academic advisors really get technology, it seems like. I mean, they're, they're constantly creating, innovating, and, and sort of figuring out ways to, to work with what they've got. I hope so. I think we're seeing more and more uh, applications that uh, really serve students. I mean, you can see how it fits in a particular advising center. Uh, then the question is always, um, well, is that something that will uh, transmit or translate to my to the level of innovation that you have on your campus? Uh, could we do something like a Wayfinder at Oregon? Um, is the Grade First Aid blog something that would that you could do at uh, UW Madison or um, uh, you know uh, Bakersfield Junior College in Southern California? You know, are these things that translate? Is there someone there? Is it an innovative camp? Uh, campus. There's so many times I return to an early George Steele article. I think it was around 2005, 2006, where he talked about, you know, is your campus um, a techno technology innovator? Do they allow for um, new and, and, and dynamic ways to explore? Or do you have to go through kind of a central approval process and the role that plays? Sometimes, whether you're in student affairs or academic affairs, you can really benefit by a supervisor who says, go for it. This right. sounds great. Let's try something. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, having the freedom to innovate. Sometimes just it's just some, having a supervisor that allows you to do it. Absolutely. I was just talking with our registrar here, um, who's very involved at the national and regional level in registrarness, and she talks a lot about leading forward. Her goal for her office is is always to leverage change. That if they have been doing, you know, major changes, 
for 10, 10 years and they do 5,000 a year and it's 5,000 data clicks, there's got to be a way to try something different, to do something different. And, you know, I, I really like the way she described that leading forward. It reminds me a lot of George Koo and Elizabeth Witt and company when they talk about a positive restlessness. And, and that's what I want in my office. And that's what, you know, that's what I think the field really is working through right now. Well, you, you mentioned the, the Great First Aid website, the, the blog. Uh, and who is it that, that did that again? It's well, uh, Becca Schultz and uh, Katie McFadden, when she was here with us, put that started that, put that together. Katie is now at Brandeis University doing terrific things there. Um, and Becca has has taken that on uh, solely uh, as part of her of her overall load. Well, and and it's, that, that wasn't an assignment that you gave her or, or, or them at the time, right? It was something sort of you said... Here's some time, some generative space. Go see what you come up, can come up with. Yeah. We were sending out either an email with all sorts of academic information to students who had just, especially Frosh students, who had just landed on probation. And and then we developed like a print newsletter, a brochure-like with all the announcements. And and after one year of doing that, we are like, oh, we don't want to send it as an attachment. Uh, our note-taking system doesn't handle attachments well. This might get rejected by the student's home email. Let's let's make a blog. And so Katie, who's already a blogger and, and, um, and really developed this and worked really hard with Becca to, to again, to, to lurk and see what other people were doing and to take the best of what was out there. And it's a it's an immersive document so they've done screencasts with our teaching and learning center they have um, a story of an audio cast of a student who was on probation and her journey back to good standing it's really a it's really a terrific blog um, and it's it's deep it's not surface comments so they they do work about every week or every 10 days and to add to an overall dialogue with students. Um, and again, that address is, or URL is uh, gradefirstaid.wordpress.com. Nice. And I, I think that they, they, they won some awards through Nakata with that blog. So that's, a, that's I, I think it's amazing what people can come up with when you give them some time and some space. Yeah. yeah, they've been lucky to be invited to some regional conferences, um, and uh, I know Becca's been invited to the national conference this year to to talk about um, the process of, and, and she may have done that with Katie, um, the process of how you literally, step by step, create a blog and also do the podcasts and the, and the screencasts as part of that process, uh, with the idea that you know, you can choose any format to do this kind of outreach. Maybe you want to do screencasting or, or vlogging or blogging or screencast or podcasting on your on your website. You don't want to do a blog, um, but learning the tools is part of a part of a bigger picture as a as a professional these days. That's sort of technology comp competency things. That, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I know you mentioned Art Esposito, and Art has done a lot of work through Facebook as his platform of choice. He's. I know. He, he's done so many videos, posted them on Facebook, interacted yeah. with his advisees on Facebook. Yeah. I mean, if, you're, if you're sort of the question of who, who to talk to about Facebook and academic advising, Art's probably the guy. I know, absolutely. It's always interesting for advisors in other parts of the country to kind of think through how uh, VCU handles, uh, you know, the confidentiality issues and the mm -hmm. FERPA issues. And mm -hmm. it's just it's just interesting to see a direction a campus has gone or an office. Yeah. And also, I want to do a shout out to Art for his blogging leading up to, I think it was Region 2. Uh, really, I mean, we have a blog out here for Region 8. Also, very dynamic. Not just, hey, we're having a conference, but really getting into issues around advising to try to build um, the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish in, in regionals. Nice. Well, I know Nak Nakata just came out with a new blog um, yeah. for the entire association as well. Um, by the way, I just want to point out that Jeff Jackson says that he assumes that there's a duck pond outside your office. Um, I encourage those types of tweets, folks. There, there probably is. You never know. Um, <laughs> probably full of those little rubber ducky things. Absolutely. We have a, a, a little moat-like thing outside our new uh, building for student-athletes, and we frequently have ducks. A couple weeks ago, I was on campus on a weekend and happened to be chatting with a prospective student, and two little ducks walked right past me while I was in the middle of this conversation. It was, it was a perfect admissions moment. 
You know, when you're when you're walking across the Oregon State University campus, it's very rare that you have a beaver <laughs> sighting. That you have sort of like you know baby beavers walking by. It just yes. doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's unfortunate. I, I know that's that's a that's a shame. Um, I have talked with colleagues at other schools. Uh, I know that, for example, you see a lot of gators at the University of Florida, actually oh, on oh. campus. If I could do a rim shot, a sound effect right now, bam, we would do it. <laughs> um, so. Oh yeah, Jeff Lale. Don't worry, people are getting the jokes here. It's it, this is the Pac, uh, this is the Pac-10 uh, Oregon State versus Oregon episode of SA Live. Yeah. Um, well, and we have that Iowa connection too, Eric. Absolutely. So we're like separated at birth, basically. It's true. You heard it here for, first, folks. Um, one one thing, Jennifer. I know that we've talked about Facebook blogs. Um, you know, we we'll briefly touched on Twitter and just social media in general. What about uh, sort of enterprise level stuff? Uh, I know you, you, you mentioned George Steele, and George has talked about you know the enterprise level um, solutions for advising quite a bit. This is something that, that we don't hear about enough, I think, in sort of the academic advising sphere. We don't hear enough about enterprise level applications at sort of from student affairs folks in general. Um, if, if someone comes to you and says, hey, what application should we look at? And I know this, this again, we'll put a little disclaimer here. This is not an endorsement from the University of Oregon or Jennifer, the president-elect of NACADA. This is just you as a professional who has some ideas. Um, you know, wh what, what's out there? for academic advisors and for sort of that enterprise level solution for advising? Well, I don't, I don't even think I need to go there in terms of actual, you know, products. We, I can say that we are at the cusp of a whole new way of using enterprise-wide systems for uh, academic advising. I mean, the ways in which um, either a homegrown system uh, like they're growing at Arizona State or Starfish, uh, there's a product, sorry, um, the ways in which we're using products that sit on data you already have, so whether it's Blackboard data or Banner data or PeopleSoft data or a homegrown student information system, I mean, we're just at the cusp of the way that campuses are going to be able to take advantage um, of the data we have in order to do outreach and real serious intervention with students. I, I think it's a Wes Habley quote um, where, uh, you know, universities are data rich and analysis poor. Mm -hmm. And the more products you see that are going to sit on top of already existing data to track our students registering for their next major class on time. That's something I know that is, is uh, they're growing at Arizona State. Advisors get a note if students don't take uh, business calculus, the, ter the last term at which they have to take business calculus to stay on time. And, and I think I have that right. Hopefully I haven't misrepresented that in any way. Um, and okay. there are, <laughs> there are We'll schools just make sure everybody there takes right. calculus, just in uh, case. That's right. Um, and so advisors are getting a note. The students are getting a note. Um, I mean, that's just one small example of these uh, CRM um, or content resource management systems that, um, and again, th the Midwest schools are pioneering the use of Starfish and other schools where you mine da Blackboard data for how students are doing their homework or taking quizzes. And so a student hops on and sees on their Blackboard page um, kind of indications and, and some of these systems are using like red light, yellow light, green light. Um, if you log on and you see you have a red light, that indicates that your quizzes are, are adding up and your homework is adding up to an at-risk student situation. So if you see a green, then, you know, you are on pace to meet the goals that have been set uh, to earn certain, certain grades or pass the class. And so we're just on the cusp of having a product or having an enterprise-wide system at, at some schools where you you are able to mine the technology, you're using technology to mine the data to improve what we want to accomplish, which is timely intervention with consistent information towards um, accurate decision-making. And I hope someone wrote that down because that I'll was, never... That was amazing. Seriously, the nice thing is we, <laughs> have that, we have that archived so that you can go back and you can yeah. write that down because... Yeah. That was very well said. Um, and, and, and honestly, Jennifer, I can shout out vendor names on the show um, okay. because there aren't a lot of, of solutions out there. Like you said, there's a lot of folks yeah. doing kind of homegrown things. Is it down at Texas Tech? Um, gosh, what's his name? Is it Joshua? Is it Joshua Barron? I think down at Texas oh, yeah. Tech. Yeah. They, they, they've done some stuff with kind of a homegrown solution. And... But again, there are some vendors out there, and I think that the the idea of you know schools being very data rich 
and not necessarily sort of doing a lot of analysis comes to the fact that a couple things. Academic advising isn't s sitting at the table uh, when it comes to a lot of these discussions around these enterprise level systems and, and what yes. we can do with the data. Because, yeah, I would agree. For example, you know, raise your hand if you're on the, if you're watching you know the tweets right now on SA Live. If you if you are a Banner School or a SunGuard School, uh, you know, or a DataTel School, PeopleSoft, there's a lot of data going in there, and that's a there's a lot of really good stuff that you could pull to sort of track at risk students. And I know that I think in Degree Works, which is a SunGuard product. Um, they, they've got a little bit of tracking that they yes. can do. And, yes. and, and it's really just, you know, it's sort of enabling advisors to have some tools that they can use to make them more efficient with some of the logistical things, more of the prescriptive things, so that you can actually have that more teaching, you know, advising as teaching moments. Absolutely. Well, it's the best use of technology when prescriptive information um, and, you know, videos on how to use the transfer database and um, uh, inform a, a screencast on how to make an academic plan are available to students 24-7. And then you can have the developmental conversation, you know, online or, or through Skype if you're doing distance work uh, or in, in your office if you're doing face-to-face. You know, that's the ideal use of technology to um, maximize a small office to reach a large number of students, which is which is our situation out here. And and is certainly true of hundreds of advising units, community college, uh, public, private, for profit, nonprofit. Um, we're all trying to do more with less. And uh, if you can somehow, as you say, get at the table, um, again, these systems are often developed for primary users like admissions or the registrar, mm -hmm. a close campus partnership um, will make a big difference in uh, having input as much as you can yeah. to this kind of development. And again, student affairs folks really have to have terrific vice provosts and very far thinking um, connections in order to again also be at the table and um, be part of that process. Well, it's, it's all in the spirit of collaboration. And it's, Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's true collaboration. It's not just we say we do it, but we don't. This is the kind of thing yeah. where you, you get admissions, financial aid, registrar, advising, all sitting around the table. And it's all about how can we go from recruiting students you know, to retaining them, everything in between until you know, graduation. Absolutely. Well, and it's also important that student affairs offices, especially on campuses that, that do have more of a divide, it's really important that um, student affairs offices are positioning what they're doing in light of the academic mission of the university um, and, and tie into those broad, um, to the stated university goals, whether it's retention, um, and tap into kind of the concerns being raised now more and more at the state level, not just re retention, but degree completion. So all offices, all units on your campus should be in line with your university goals. And that will be one more way that um, these units that might feel further away from the academic mission um, do have a part in the conversation. Nice. So Jennifer, I'm going to debut a new feature on the show that um, you're not going to be able to see it until you watch the archive, okay. but right. I have a question for you, and I'm going to actually show the question to the folks who are viewing at home, to the home audience. Um, is this like Karnak? Do I need it, to think of... I, uh, will, I will read it out loud to you, so you don't okay. have to guess what it is. Um, so here's the question. It comes from Emily Pack, and, and Emily wants to know, why is academic advising so often seen as separate from the rest of student affairs, and what can we do about that? So what do you think about that? And again, there isn't a right or wrong answer to this question. Sure. Yeah. Well, the neat thing is that it's not, that's not true at, at all campuses, that um, whether it's small campuses or the spirit of collaboration, connection, and communication on your campus, where um, there's, there's a lot of history of shared programming or a lot of history of um, common goals. So that's, it's not entirely true on all campuses um, in, in general, and that also may be reflective of um, maybe a historical trend where uh, student affairs and academic affairs, they weren't just seen as having separate goals, they were seen as real paradigmatic differences. And uh, I hope that new generations of graduates, uh, whether they're graduating liberal arts, they're graduating through College of, of Ed or other graduate programs, are seeing uh, really an integrated mission from your university. 
um, on campuses where you feel as a student affairs professional that, that you're not connecting with academic services or academic affairs, um, the more the more actual specific programs you can connect with. So sometimes it's not enough to just go to a general meeting and say, we want to do more together. What would that be? But to come with a specific idea or, you know, you want to reach Frosh, 92% of the Frosh on our campus, first year students, sorry, are in the residence halls. How can we get advising into the residence halls or how can we have our housing uh, res life um, professionals be part of a, a larger academic mission um, can is there like you know advising 101 you know we don't want to do any harm but are there ways we connect that we're not connecting um, here at Oregon I probably the exemplar for this is our first year programs uh, the fig they, and, and they run these FIGs that have the FIG assistants, the sophomores and juniors, actually living in the residence halls, integrating the gen ed classes, the connecting course taught by faculty. They're doing programming in the residence halls about the FIG. I mean, it's, it's just insane how integrative and diving deep that program is in terms of learning. And it, we couldn't do it without housing and residence life and Michael Griffel and Mike Eister and other professionals here who've, who've just done terrific work. And of course, this is one campus among many that really pioneer this type of deep connection. Well, and here's, here's the next question is, are you going to publish this at all, a case study, a white paper? Uh, it seems like these types of programs, the more and more people need to learn about them because you, you can talk about the successes. You can talk about you know all the great sort of integration and, and folks living in and and, and all the teaching yeah. that's occurring. But the steps, the sort of the breakdown, the blueprint of how it went down. I think folks need to see this. And and yeah. you know, maybe it's something that comes out through Nakata, um, which you might have a little bit of pull with. <laughs> I don't know. Just saying. Hey, actually, um, I don't. I don't have one right here to hold up. But um, <laughs> Nakata and the first year experience uh, program through South Carolina, and I'm and I'm not rem the National Center for First Year Experience, mm -hmm. actually have co-published. It was published just a few years. And if Charlie's listening or Marsha Miller are listening, they can get the link out on the Twitter feed. They did a terrific combined document on working with um, first year programs all across the country to really hit that, those transition issues for first year and other students. So some examples are there. Um, yeah, so there's been some preliminary work with that um, to get those models out on campus. And that's the one I'm thinking of right now. I'm sure there are other examples. Okay, nice. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I, I want to point out that uh, there was a tweet from uh, Talisman Guide, which is a, a vendor. I, I believe they're a soft, software creator. Uh, it says, biting my tongue so hard right now, I think I drew blood. Oh, no. Make sure oh, no. you're taking care of yourself, folks. Self-care is important. And if you have <laughs> something to say and you want to use the essay live hashtag, please feel free to use it. Uh, you know, If you're an individual, you're an office, you're a company or service, etc., contribute to the dialogue. Uh, you know, We'd love to hear what you have to say. I'll try to incorporate it into the show. If it doesn't fit for this particular show, we could probably put it in the next one. So please feel free to ask questions. Jennifer and I will be on the air uh, until at least you know the top of the hour and you know, ask questions. I you know I we can get a lot of stuff out of here and, and and Jennifer has a ton of info. So I want to transition just a little bit to Nakata. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of time to talk about Nakata. A um, couple of things. Now I know that you you were just elected. When was the official announcement? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I was notified. I think in I think in April. Um, yeah. And uh, and the announcements are made you know throughout throughout the year at through different venues um, yeah and I and I take office in October after the term of Kathy Stockwell at mm. Fox Valley Technical College Sounds like I'm getting a uh, you know fire truck alarm here this is what happens when you live on a major thoroughfare um, everything's fine the studios is fine um, good I, you know, I, I hope that that's kind of a similar sort of announcement that they gave you. When uh, I hope it wasn't just an email. I hope they came in fire trucks. Charlie Nutt pulls up in a fire truck. Trumpets blaring. You know, congratulations. Um, yes. And, and folks, it's, if you're just tuning in, I want to just point out this is I'm, I'm mentioning uh, Jennifer was elected as president elect of Nakata for 2012. Correct? You'll be president. Yes. Then? Yes, from October 2011 to 2012, October. Um, actually, what happens, it's a lot like the Ed McMahon publisher sweepstakes. Um, yeah, Charlie comes to your door. You go, oh, my gosh. Um, 
Yeah, no, it, it, it's such an honor. It's such a privilege. It's such a great organization. And, you know, you're not just the president of, of the, I mean, you're obviously a figure and uh, somebody, somebody people kind of invite or, or, or notice or, or have part of the presentation process, but you're actually representative of a really dynamic board. Uh, so I'm serving with some terrific people. Um, yeah, Glenn Kepik and uh, Josh Smith as the vice president, and um, Pat Folsom, Karen Sullivan Vance, in addition to the board that I'm, I've been on now for about a year, uh, Celeste Pardee and uh, Beth Higgins, a lot of folks all over the country. So you're, you're you know, you kind of have the title, but you're part of a pretty dynamic council and uh, leadership structure. I mean, uh, one of the neat things about Nakata, I think. Absolutely. Um, well, and, and again, it's the combination of, of, of the volunteer members like yourself and then the executive staff. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I, I think when you work in conjunction, and, and it seems like the, 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 the group at Nakata really work well together and, and put out some of the cool things. And Speaking of cool things, I know you mentioned Laura Pasquini. Are, you two are doing something together, I saw. What, yes. What is, what is that? Yeah, in uh, September, uh, we're going to be doing a webinar with Lee Cunningham. And, you know, just a shout out again to the executive office. I haven't ever done anything with the executive office where my skills weren't improved and I, you know, I, I didn't emerge as a smarter, sharper professional. So they're just terrific to work with. And the webinar is focusing on uh, kind of the big picture of developing a, str a technology strategic plan uh, for your unit or as a professional. Um, we've had a lot of webinars that have highlighted particular tools, um, several that have taken, you know, examples of things. But what we wanted to do now was step back and and with, you know, Laura's leadership and my input as a president and talk a little bit about, well, where does this fit for you? You know, it's not just rush out and do Twitter. It's not just, hey, We've got a barn. Let's do a Facebook account. You know, it's it's got to fit into a bigger picture. We we are trying to do more with less. We really need an integrated plan. There has to be a bigger picture, a bigger reason. And again, it should be the mission of your office, the mission of your institution, and it and it should be deep. It shouldn't just be try a hundred things. It should be one thing, two things that you're going to do well. Yes. Th that's really where we're going. Str strategic. And, Absolutely. And, and asking sort of the why before the how. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where do you want to go? How an assessment, right? How will you know when you get there? Um, and I also think that will, over the long run, break some new ground. Um, really, you know, we really learned from the private sector about assessment and social media, assessment and technology. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited to start the conversation with Laura. And of, and of course, she's just fabulous. I love working with her. She's smart, smart, smart. And uh, I learn so much every single time. Well, of course, Laura was the guest on the show, I think episode number two, she came on and talked about um, PLNs, personal learning networks. Oh, which, gosh, yeah. You know, that's sort of taking the, yeah. the technology that we're using to, to assist our students, to teach our students, and to kind of turning it back on ourselves. Absolutely. Our and, and your office should have a, a, a a PLN. You know, your office should have a plan. And if you're an advisor or you're a residence life professional or you're in financial aid and you're part of a unit that, that isn't developing um, through through a professional development program, well, you, you need to make an appointment with your administrator and maybe make that part of your year-long development um, as part of your growth. You're going to work with your administrator to develop a, a bigger picture, a plan of ongoing development for technology and other issues uh, with your office. And as an administrator, absolutely. Um, you should have a plan. You should be thinking of your advisor's personal development, but also your, your office, your long-term plans for your office. Well, I think that falls into... Um so, you know, you mentioned Brad, uh, and I'm Brad, I apologize if I destroy your name, but I believe it's uh, Papiolic. And oh, I, sorry. I was sorry, my, my fault. No, yeah. it's, so Brad, Brad um, tweeted, um, I think this question sort of falls into what you were talking about, was how can we have leaders in academic advising in the field buy into your particular philosophy and commitment around technology? Uh, because, again, it's that strategy, it's commitment, and it's allowing your people the time to, to develop these things. Um. Uh, yeah, I, it's shared more widely. Uh, sometimes administrators are balancing so many different things that it's that it's difficult to see either where technology fits in or to or to be adding technology to your overall philosophy of of advisor development. 
So I think we're, we're at the beginning of this. Um, I do know some of the ways that I do this, um, for example, and Nakata is really committed to this. We, uh, Nancy Marquis and I, at, and she's at University of Nevada, Reno, have just just about finishing editing a monograph on advising administration. And um, you, know, you know all about this because you and Laura yeah. Hold and on. Art- you're, you're, it's almost done? Is that the deal? <laughs> it is almost. It's, okay. it's soon to go off to the publisher. Thank, thank heavens. I believe it was 18 years ago when we first I, started writing this. Don't, don't, don't start with me. <laughs> It's such a it's such an amazing long um, it's such an amazing process. It's it's neat to see the backstage of how these things get published. Uh, Marsha Miller is a saint. I pretty much already know that, but uh, it's confirmed. And and we're not only positioning uh, these you know kind of budget issues, resiliency, leadership, career ladders as part of the monograph, but we're also talking about sustainability. Uh, you, Laura, Art, and George are positioning. Uh, uh, technology and the importance of having a strategic plan, you know, that's going to be, um, at this point, it's the only uh, f- uh, focused monograph on advising administration. So those are ways that we're going to, um, you know, uh, uh, get the conversation going more and more. And of course, as people like Brad and Laura and Art and leaders in the field, Charlie, the whole team at Nakata has taken on Nakata uh, technology issues. It's going to be more and more part of our overall conversation. Absolutely. Well, speaking of that, when October hits and you become officially become president of Nakata, what are some of the initiatives that you hope to push through, advocate for, you know, create? Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly be building on uh, Kathy Stockwell and Jane Drake's work, Casey Self, in terms of looking at diversity, looking at connection with campus partners, um, you know, building resiliency over time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in technology, obviously, and um, I'm very interested in uh, training and development and diversity. So the ways in which we build, we build really the advising office and the campus of the future, the, the campus we want to work on, um, is part of creating a dynamic learning environment, not just for, you know, not just for our advisors, but also modeling that for students. And one of the things I liked about the the link you had, uh, I liked all the links, and we could talk for hours about that, but the student engagement challenges from a CIO perspective is, and a post from Scott McLeod a couple weeks ago, that learning, that there's a difference between being a listener and a learner, between being a student and a learner, and it's it's deep, engaged rigor. You're diving in, you, you and in my opinion, I, I want to create a work environment where, um, where it's, it's part of a, a really positive work environment around learning, adult learning, because that's really what we are as advising professionals. We're adult learners. And, um, and building that into the routine of how our office operates. So um, that's a lot of detail, obviously. I'm still working out kind of the bigger picture. But technology and then creating an office that thrives in tough situations. And I think part of that is always leading forward, always shooting for that positive restlessness, even when times are tough, um, you can still innovate. You can still be excited about what I think is the best job in the world, working with students, academic advising. I just couldn't ask for anything better. Well, I think you're an awesome professional in the field, and I I say this even though you're at an institution that I have issues with sometimes. Um, in all seriousness, though, you, you, do, you do a great job, and, and seriously, you just did a quack sound, which... The, the Twitter sphere is going to erupt with awesome. <laughs> on, I think about that. So, so make Gen- a good duck. Jennifer, last last question. I don't even know what kind of sound a beaver makes, so I won't even attempt it. <laughs> last last question, uh, and it's an easy one. What are your top five favorite websites? It's a new thing I'm going to ask everybody who comes on the show. <sighs> well, not so easy for me. I'm a Gemini, obviously. <laughs> it's I, I think of more in terms of categories, so humor. Uh, I have to say Cronk News and uh, The Oatmeal. Um, in terms of aggregators, I live for Delicious, which you turned me on to, and Mashable, which uh, Laura Pesquini and others do a great job of referencing. I uh, love Laura Pesquini and kind of the other Nakata professionals like you, George Steele, Art, who are really doing great work in terms of blogs and and getting the information word out. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. I, I tend to think more in terms of broader categories and and 
kind of picking and choosing. I love design, so I use Delicious a lot to explore design issues, even though I I physically don't do anything with that. It, it helps me be a creative thinker. And uh, so whether I'm look, using a TED Talk or whether I'm using Mashable or Nakata's blog, um, all of these kind of things are percolating for me constantly. So sorry, I'm, I'm not a very good exemplar for your first one. That's a no. You did a great job. I think actually you set the bar so high. Oh, other, other people, other people are going to need a step stool. Um, Jennifer Jocelyn, folks, if you're if you're watching the live stream right now, Jennifer Jocelyn is the director of academic advising at the University of Oregon, as well as the president elect of Nakata. Jennifer, thank you for coming on Student Affairs Live. It was a pleasure to interview you and have you on the show. Oh, such a such a treat, and a big shout out to the SA Chat folks. I learned so much from colleagues uh, from all across campus, all across the country. You know, it's a real blessing. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. It's it's been great being part of your tribe, Eric, and uh, part of the bigger picture. And thanks so much. It's any time. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, folks. Wow, what an episode, and I know some of you were, were tweeting uh, about you know Jennifer's enthusiasm and passion, and, and I, uh, gosh, she is an outstanding professional, and we'll have her on the show again to talk about some other things, I'm sure, when she gets sort of on board with Nakata as president in October. So, as always, folks, Student Affairs Live is sponsored by Integral, the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. And that happens this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're going to send out that tweet in a second with the link. And, and folks, seriously, without sponsorship, we don't have a show, so please feel free to check out that link. Check out their webinar. There's a lot of cool things happening with Integral, and, and take a look at it. Next week's show, I'm really excited about it. We're going to have another Oregonian on, uh, Mamta Akapati, the, the dean of students at Oregon State University, who tweets as Dean Mamta is coming on the show, and uh, Mom's just going to kind of talk about the state of uh, things with sort of the Dean of Student Affairs world, uh, as well as uh, her future plans to go uh, sort of as, I don't know if it's a sabbatical or a hiatus or something, but uh, she's going to Semester at Sea. She's going to be the Dean of Students uh, on board one of the vessels for Semester at Sea, uh, and so that's going to be a really unique experience for her, and I'm really excited to hear her perspective of why she's doing it. So, uh, as always, folks, my name is Eric Stoller. This is Student Affairs Live, and we will catch you next week.